This morning, our first talk is by Ali Istalifi, who we first met Ali a year or so ago when he consulted with us on an exhibition of Central Asian textiles, our ECOP exhibition. Some of you came to that, I think. He wrote the essay for that catalog. He's a specialist in ethnographic arts and culture from Central Asia. Uh, Ali is a filmmaker. He's a project director at the Jindhag Foundation. He lives in London, but he was born and spent some part of his childhood in Afghanistan. And over some dinner or another, when he was here for the ECOT show, we discovered that the little town, the community that he comes from, East Alif, just north of Kabul in Afghanistan, was a traditional pottery making village where people specialized in the beautiful turquoise pots that Afghanistan is known for. So I'm not going to tell you anything of that story because he's going to tell you the story of his village, what happened and what's happening now. And when you have a break, if you go up to the Asian gallery, you will find several examples that Ali very kindly donated to our museum so you can see the pots in person. So please welcome Ali Stolifi. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. I come from three generations of um, specialists of arts and crafts of Afghanistan. And my father, in particular, the 1970s and the 1980s, was one of the most renowned um, dealers of Afghan arts and crafts and folklore. Um, and he exported everything from Afghanistan all over the world. He was very well known, and he still is, I would say. And um, I remember when I was seven years old, at that point I was living in Afghanistan. And I, we would play around in my father's shop. And I was mesmerized by my dad, and I would sit with him, and I would ask him one day, one particular day, I said, Dad, why do you do what you do? You know, all of my friends' fathers are engineers or doctors and so on, so why do you, why do you shopkeeper, why do you sell this kind of stuff? And he said something very interesting to me. He said, son, folk art has the ability to empower, sustain, and elevate a community, as well as help bridge cultures. Very beautiful words of wisdom, except that I was only seven years old, so I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, I wanted to know why he wasn't an action hero. <laughs> um, but for some reason, those words stuck with me. By the time I was a teenager, I dismissed these words as some salesmanship my dad was telling me, forgot that I'm his son and not one of his clients. Um, but it was only until my 20s that I began to understand what he, knew, what he meant by this. Once I embarked on this project to help revive um, a community of pottery. And I think I will share this story with you and I think you will also understand the power of folk art, the power of pottery. It's not just clay shaped into a vessel or into a ware. It's something deeper than that and has a much more stronger power and hopefully this talk would somehow embody the essence of this uh, wonderful symposium, Communities on Clay. And it's the story of Istalif, which is my father's hometown. Um, and it's um, interesting because I have never been to Istalif except when I was a baby. Um, but I've always knew about it. And it's an ancient pottery community in Afghanistan and a very well-known place. It's um, located about 45 minute drive north of Kabul, as you can see on the map. Um, and it's a very beautiful place. It's an extreme, unfortunate picture, I'm not sure if it ju does justice to it, but it's an extremely beautiful place. And it's famous for its natural beauty, including the mineral springs, mountain views, and the river. Adobe homes peek through fruit gardens full of mulberry trees, ancient grapevines. In fact, um, the name Istalif, some suggest, comes from the Greek word istafil, um, which means grapes, I think. Um, and the idea, well, the, uh, some people suggest that when Alexander the Great actually conquered 
the Persian Empire, and then the armies went out and the Hellenistic dynasty was set up. They saw this place full of grapes, and they called it the Stafil, which over time became known as Istalev. Now, during the 1960s and 1970s, it was a very popular tourist spot. So the hippie movement that people went to, to you know, to explore exotic lands. Um, they were those who landed in Afghanistan. They would often go to um, Istalev because it was so easy to get to, and it had this um, hotel. It was on the edge of the mountain. So the town is on an edge of the mountain. I don't know if you, some of you have seen Lord of the Rings, the second one, and that kind of civilization on the mountain. So it's a bit like that, but a very small version of that. <laughs> and, um, you know, people would go there, find it for day picnics, or, um, and hang out in the fruit and vegetable gardens, and the fruits are just so delicious, it's you know, organic, uh, and just enjoy the fresh air. And then finally, once they have a good day there, they would go to the main market, the bazaar, which was this strip of 120 shops as you see there. These are the pictures from the 1970s and 60s that I had to gather from everywhere. And uh, they would go to these, uh, to the market, and that's where the real talent of the Stalin people were there. Um, you would, uh, you know, they would, they would display all their folk art. And their folk art, they did a lot of different types of folk art. The Stalin was a community of artisans. They did things like ethnographic, ethnic jewelry, weaving, sheepskin jackets. In fact, during the 1970s and 1960s, these kind of fur coats were pretty hip. And many of them came from Stalin. But their quintessential folk art was the pottery. Um, these pottery, they boasted these beautiful shapes, these um, with often this wonderful turquoise glaze. As you see there, and sometimes green, sometimes adobe, sometimes brown. And it was not so much about the patterns and the designs. They were very simple and archaic, um, but it was the shapes um, and the fact that they've been doing it in the same way for um, centuries. Um, and they made all sorts of stuff. They made things like bowls, plates, candlestick holders, vases, teapots, cups, everything you could imagine that where they would make it. Um, and here's some examples of um, the pottery you can see. Um, little animal figures. And, and somehow you could imagine this was made 300 years ago the same way as now. The production process of the pottery, again, was very ancient. They haven't been modernized in any shape, way, or form. Um, the clay, the preparing the clay, they gather the clay on the mountains and the surrounding mountain regions. Um, and then once they refined it from pebbles. Uh, it is mixed with fiber plant and water. And then the young men would, for hours on end, as you see on the right photo, they would stamp on it, you know, to get the, get the clay ready. Um, and then they would use um, a very, very ancient classic kick wheel to um, shape these beautiful vessels and um, vases and, and pots and so on. And often the, pot, uh, the person who did this would be the monster potter. Um, and it would often be the grandfather or um, the father. And the young kids would watch them and learn. You've got to understand the start of pottery is a family tradition. So um, this was their brethren. Um, and, and they would teach, each, each father would teach his kid the kind of the art. And each family would have their little secrets um, in terms of uh, how they made it. And, they were known for particular shapes and so on. Once um, the pots were made, uh, they would lay them in the sun uh, for a few days uh, for it to semi-dry. And then they bring it back to the workshop and sand it and sharp, kind of smoothen the edges, if you will. And the women in the community would come and carve geometric patterns and floral patterns on them. The simplicity of the designs really reflect the simplicity of the people. They were drawing um, ideas and shapes and motifs from uh, their own surroundings, which was often flowers, or vegetable gardens, and so on. Then finally, they would go through the glazing process, um, which was then to go part of it. The of pottery is known for its glazes. Um, and the shapes, of course, but the glazes were the main thing. And every time I go there and I try and understand what, what's the recipe of the glazes, none of them would tell me. Um, they're very secretive about it because one family doesn't want to expose their craft. It's a bit like 
you imagine somebody with a cooking recipe and they don't want to give it up to anybody else. The glazing process was often, um, I think some say they have potassium in it or I don't know what the ingredients were, but it hasn't been changed for years. Um, and then they would put um, these pottery, they stack them up in very traditional looking kilns. I mean, if you look at some of these kilns, it looks like it belonged like 200 years ago. Uh, and they stack about 600 pieces in these mud wall kilns. Um, each piece that they put on, they would put a little mud trifle over it, and then they put the next one on, and they would stack them up, put about 600 pieces in there. And all the family, before they fire the kiln, they would gather together and make a prayer. It was important for them that uh, make a prayer because if one piece fell, that said the whole thing topples. And that said they don't have food for two months. Um, and then once they fired the kilns, um, they would bring these potteries and then local market would buzz off and they would display it for the tourists and the visitors. And this was really the economic base, the economic um, base of the community, and this is what fed it. So pottery was the integral part of the community. Most of you know about Afghanistan, I'm sure, and unfortunately Afghanistan went through many years of war, almost 40 years now. Every community, not just the Stalag, suffered from it, but the Stalag, uh, they're one of the worst victims of the Afghan war. And for those of you not familiar with um, Afghan war, there were three, really three phases. Um, the first phase was when the Soviets invaded, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Um, and when they invaded Afghanistan, they mainly focused their armies and on the big cities. So Kabul, Herat, all the major cities were the Soviets, but the rural areas, let it be. Uh, and because Afghans at core didn't agree with the Soviet ideology, many people began to resist it. Uh, and often the resistance grew in rural areas. Um, the problem with this was the communities that relied on people to come and buy their pottery, their arts and folk arts. The movement of people stopped during this time. So this quite significantly um, affected the start of the community because Pottery is something you make in your own village and you rely on people to come to buy it. And if people are not going to come to buy it, how do you feed yourself? And of course, the Soviets didn't care about that. After the Soviets left in 1989 and the communist regime toppled, um, there's, a, there's a power vacuum in the country. And all these different resistant movements had a brutal war. Everyone trying to gain power, and everybody's trying to get power. And again, this affected all these little rural communities quite badly because you couldn't even go to the next street without having to go through 10 checkpoints, let alone go to this beautiful community and enjoy their day. All those basic luxuries that we take in life here for granted, these people then have the privilege to have. Finally, the arrival of Taliban in 1996. So the Taliban came and swept the country, and they, they captured the capital, and um, the government was ousted from Kabul, and they went to the north. As you can see on the map, they went to the north. And the Taliban basically held the capital, and in the north was the government, and they were battling each other. The bad luck of the Stalag, it lay just in the middle of the battlefield. So one week the Taliban will capture it, one week the government will capture it. This kept going on for years. And of course, the Stalag people resisted the Taliban because the Taliban were everything about, against culture and arts and crafts. And the Stalag people were a community of arts and crafts. So the Taliban came with an idea. They thought, well, you know, these guys have a headache for us. How do we remove this headache? If we depopulate all these rural areas, then basically no one will live there. And if no one lives there, no one can exist with us. So in many of the flat ground rural areas, they put mines, but in Stalif, because it was on the mountainside, they thought, well, the easiest thing to do is just burn it down, forge it to the ground. And um, that's what they did. So a beautiful, once a beautiful community that looked like this,
least can be very brutal during war. With no homes, no shops, no workshops, um, the Slavic community had no choice but to leave. Um, and many of them um, went to Kabul as refugees um, or to Pakistan. And of course, they couldn't practice their craft because pottery is not something you can, it's not a textile you can work on in any place. You needed your community to do that. In the current times, for those of you who want to understand the plight of refugees, it's not that it comes from places like that. But, on a positive note, what man can destroy, man can rebuild. The audacity of a stubborn young man, which just happened to be me, that little guy there. <laughs> in early 2000, I was living in London. I had been away from Afghanistan for many years. I had just graduated studying film and wanted to be the next Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have a job or money. <laughs> I was broke, you know, big dreams, but broke. After the Taliban fell in 2001, and Afghanistan got liberated after the terrible incidents of September 11, Afghanistan became the center of the world's attention, and a lot of NGOs and organizations would go back to Afghanistan, how we built it. And as all of you remember, nobody knew what to do, how to fix this place. Um, and at this point, living in London without a job, without an income, I came up with this audacious idea. I want to do my bit for Afghanistan. I want to go and help rebuild the start. And uh, I remember everyone, including my mother, said, son, you know, just get a job, you know, you can do that sometime else, you know, just get a job. This is too much of an audacious idea. They're like, nope, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so they said, let's, let, let, let's humor him for a bit. Everyone, everyone said, this is a crazy idea. Except for my dad. When I called him, I was like, Dad. And this is the first time we reconnected after many, many years, a decade long, because he stayed in Afghanistan throughout the thick and thin. He was a very wealthy man who used his wealth to help his Stalin people while they were refugees. So he had it in him. He understood that his son has that in him as well. So um, he said, That's a great idea, son. I like it. So we approached um, our friends, um, Ira and Sylvia Surratt, you see. That, um, who actually live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they have this incredible gathering, a huge shop, almost a city block of ethnographic arts, decorative arts from Central Asia, Afghanistan, all over the world. And, and during the 1970s and 19, late 60s, Ira was working in Afghanistan. Um, he was exporting arts, and those were the peaceful times. He was exporting rugs, carpets, all kinds of ethnographic arts all over the world. And now he's become one of the most renowned um, dealers in the world, I would say. Um, and he lives in Santa Fe. So, when I was calling my dad, I said, How do we do it? How do we rebuild this stuff? He came back with his philosophy, you know, sound folk art, use folk art. I said, Dad, this is not Star Wars, and folk art is not the force, you know? <laughs> Tell me something, like just build it on the strength of the people. And in 2003, my father and I went to Santa Fe to draw up a plan with Ira and Sylvia Surratt. So how do we fix this place? Now you have to understand, my father and the Surrettes had over 40 years of experience in pro promoting handicrafts. I mean, they've really helped build cottage industries. They've helped build um, um, they've helped support a lot of arts and crafts and introduce it to the world. So they knew what they were doing. It, what we came up with is to focus the project. I mean, Ira and Sylvia donated about $150,000 of their own money, and they set up a foundation called Jinhoff Foundation. And I mean, $150,000 is not a lot of money, but for this kind of audacious project. Uh, and we thought, look, we don't have the UN backing us. We don't have the USA backing us. We're just a little four people. Um, so if we take our money and target it um, on folk art, which was the pottery, if we could somehow revive the pottery, which was the heartbeat of this community, um, we will bring the pulse back to this dead community. In theory, they were beautiful. <laughs> so we decided, well, how do I mean, it's easy to say, let's revive the pottery, but how do we do it? How do we do it? You can't just go and build some couple of kilns and expect that to revive the community. 
So we thought, look, what's the economic base of the community? The economic base was this bazaar, this 120 shops. And if we could somehow rebuild this 120 shops, and it will be an infrastructure, an economic base for the community, but you ignite the fire, the fire will spread. Great, we had a plan now. We had some money, some cash. So I thought I'd pack my bag and went to Afghanistan. This is a war zone, you've got to understand. I mean, it's a very dangerous place. And uh, I went to Afghanistan. At this point in Afghanistan, you get a lot of foreign aid work. Everybody was there. So when you sit in, in Kabul, you would sit with everybody came to help something or another. And I would meet a lot of people from big NGOs, the UN, and so on. And say, Ali, who do you work for? A little organization called General Foundation. Um, where is your office? It's the fold under my shoulder. I don't have an office. What are you here to do? I'm here to build a star lift. How are you going to do it? I thought, well, it's simple. Um, I'm going to take this money, rebuild the market, circle this money quick enough in this area, and jump start a false economy. It's like, do you have a degree in this kind of stuff? No. Well, how do you know the work? I said, I, I remember in my history class in high school, something about Keynesian economics. If you do a little project, circulate the money, it will work. He said, Andy, have you been to Stalif? I said, no, I just got there two days ago. He said, well, you need to go to Stalif. First see you, the playing field, before you start this game. So I said, all right, fine, let's look at Stalif. And when I went there, I said, uh oh, this is a huge land. This is big. What did I get myself into? Uh, I came back, I'll meet these people again, and they said, um, Annie, look, just take the money and go back. You're going to waste this. This is not going to work. And that was music to my ears. You cannot do it. I said, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. <laughs> so we kind of went to Afghanistan and to Stalin, and we gathered all the village elders and tried to kind of inspired them. I said, look, folks, we're here to build your place. How are we going to do this? We're going to build this. And these guys probably had millions and millions of dollars. I said, look, just get them psyched up. If we can get them psyched up, if we can get them confident, we will bring hope in, in their hearts. And hope can achieve big things. Um, and I was telling everybody this, and you know, I could see that they look in their faces and they said, this is so naive, this kid. But they were humoring me. But as I was going, trying to explain these things to them, no one would take me seriously. So I had to come up creatively. I said, Ali, you're a storyteller, you're a filmmaker. Come up with a clever way to sell this. Um, I hired an American contractor from Texas, Timothy Alish. And I said, Tim, you have to act like you're the boss. We're going to take you seriously. Yeah. And um, Tim would um, come in in his land cruiser, and, and everybody would go, Mr. Tim, Mr. Tim, I think this is going to happen. I'm at the back. But it's important for the people not to feel that they're going to get charity. It's important for the people to feel that they're going to rebuild it themselves. I mean, that cliche, you know, give the person a fish, you feed them for a day, teach them how to fish. And I wasn't going to patronize them. They're not children. They can rebuild themselves. They just need a little bit of help. And we just got to make them believe over 30 years of war has killed their confidence. And if we can just give them confidence and hope, it worked. So we set up the project. Um, we're all set up to go. The money is there, about $1,200 a shot. Um, we were very tight with budget. Um, and we were ready to begin in about five days. This is around 2004. Um, we were ready to begin this idea. Uh, and I remember Tim, my dad, and I went there. And we had this German contractor who was doing the work. Um, and they said, but Ali, there's rubble there. I said, oh, Dan, he's like, you need to clear the rubble. I said, like, well, just clear it while you build. He said, you know, this is going to cost another $150,000 to clean this rubble. How are you going to do this? That night I couldn't sleep. Here I'm this close to starting this project and all these things that I imagine will happen, but I need to raise $150,000 in four days. How am I going to do this? Um, I said, you need your filmmaking technique, you know, perform, okay? And I remember this documentary about Alexander the Great, how he inspired his armies after they defeated the Persian Empire, conquered Central Asia, and then he's like, let's go and conquer India. And what he did is he led by example. I thought, let's use that. 
So I went there and I took a mullet. I said, folks, I gathered all the villagers there and I said, folks, um, you know, um, I need to clear this rubble in four days. But if I do it, it'll take me about a year. Um, but if you guys help me, we can do it in four days. And I went there and I started hammering a wall and just looking through my eyes, see anybody's following me. Well, eventually when that first wall toppled, everyone felt embarrassed. I started the whole community. In about four days, we cleaned the place up. We had big rubble, hair rubble there, but the place was just cleaned up, ready for the reconstruction. Um, but now we have all this rubble. What do we do with this? Somebody's taking their rubble and chucking in the neighbor's land, and another person is taking their rubble and chucking another neighbor's land, and all it was chaos. I said, look, folks, use the rubble, use the old bricks, and we build your homes. We're going to recycle everything. Um, and that's what they did. A lot of people used the old bricks and helped rebuild their homes. And the construction began. The construction was pretty swift. Um, we started at the end of 2004 and um, completed it by early 2005. Um, the whole community got involved, as you can see on those photos. Um, it was important that it had to be a show. It wasn't just about building a 120 shops, that doesn't do it. It had to show that at the center of this community, there is this audacious project. Nothing is more powerful than that, for people to believe things are gonna change. And if they start believing things are gonna change, they're gonna start coming to it. Um, so we finally finished um, the shops, and um, our budget was very tight. It was so funny because um, every brick mattered. <laughs> You know, every morning I'd come and count, count the bricks. You know, how many bricks do we have? How many cement bags do we have? Because I couldn't afford it. One cement bag is gone. That's it. You've got to understand. I'm living on my credit cards right now at this point, you know? So um, I didn't have much money for myself. It was, I wasn't getting any income out of this. Um, and when you do something like this, you're dealing with a lot of people. And everybody wants to kind of. Um, Basically, everybody has their own little sensitivities, and the key is that to um, deal with every one of them. And there's two particular tales that um, I remember, two particular stories. Um, the story of this old man and the story of this young man. Uh, the old man was this, he must have been a hundred years old. So this guy was a blacksmith, and he had made a makeshift shop in the rubble. And one day while I was working, directing everybody, okay, you take this here, you take that there, blah, blah, blah. Um, this old man he was like shaking and he took my hand and he wanted to kiss it. And I pulled back, I didn't understand. I thought, is he a relative or something? I don't know anyone here. And he said, please, quit this project. I thought, why? Just quit this project, please. Because the guy that I'd made my niche of shop is telling me to pack up and leave because now his shop's going to be built and this is going to ruin me. What do you do? You help the community and let go of the condition. He needs to eat. And I remember I said, I don't have any more money to build a shop for this guy. Where am I going to do this? Um, and when you look at this guy, it's like, he must have been 80, 90 or something. And he was feeding his entire family. And he didn't, he, he was a blacksmith, he didn't care less about pottery. Um, and I said, look, I remember that night when I sat down and I said, you cannot let anyone go, you have to help everyone. Otherwise, it's going to be no point. I called my bank, I said, look, can you transfer $1,000 from my credit card into my account? And we took that money, and we took this little bit piece of land that my dad owned, and we built him a shop as well. Because we, and he was to this day, I think he died um, about 10 years ago, but his kids to this day come and hug me and give me tea and all this stuff every time they go. And then there was the story of the young man. And so while I was doing all this work, this kid, um, everywhere I go, he follow me. I mean, I thought he was probably mesmerized. Somebody from abroad has come in. He just wants to kind of modernize and so on. I would go to the bathroom. I'd come out. He has a viewer of water. I would wash your hands there. He was like, look, kid, what's the big deal? He must have been about 16 or something. I was like, look, kid, I appreciate all this kind of niceties, but you know, um, what do you really want? And then, no, 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 my father told me, um, um, please, uh, like, I need to kind of help you if you need anything. I was like, look, just tell me what's bugging you, okay? And he said, um, 
I'm as short as the world's short. And um, we just want to know when we get to the end. So imagine you're getting free food and the guy at the end of the queue is worried. So if he's going to get some food, and that made me think of the transportation, the amount of ailments. And finish we did. Um, 2005, we finished the crops, the infrastructure built there. Okay, so now we planted the seed. All this talk, is it going to work? You know, is it really going to work? I mean, it's easy to just theorize, but is it going to really work? Um, well, to our surprise, by 2006, the community, the tree just grew, just like that. Um, people were inspired, the infrastructure helped, people rebuilt pottery, filled the shops with it, kids started going to school. And when you, and you've got to understand, a lot of NGOs don't spend money in war-torn places unless there's something there. So when there's an infrastructure there, then NGOs come. So a lot of money came because of that. And of course, I was hustling and hustling with everybody, trying to get everyone to bring their money there. And it started suddenly became a functional community within a year. All because the, the economic base was there. And you see they even made sheepskin and everything. The problem is it worked too well. <laughs> okay, they had too much pottery. Everything was filled and no one is coming. Not enough people are coming to buy. And every time I would go, they expect big things from me. You know, they expect, oh, Ali's here. What's next? So we thought, well, we have to. We can't just stop here. This the pottery is revived. I am not going to go and talk to people who've been making something for three hundred years and teach them how to do what they do. They know what to do uh, in terms of making pottery, reviving it. They can do it. Um, but now that we've revived it, we have to make a market for them. Um, how do we make a market? I mean, these pottery is beautiful, but I don't think any of us are going to go to Afghanistan, well, other than me, any of us are going to go to Afghanistan for a holiday. So I have to take all this stuff to them, to, to the rest of the world. So um, we came up with this idea that we're going to buy a lot of pottery. We're going to boost the economy. And in 2006, I went to Afghanistan again, and I went to Stalin. And everybody was like, oh, and he's back. All the kids was running <laughs> I'd become a legend there, supposedly. You know, I'm trying to kind of sneak in. And what's next? What's next? I said, I'm here to buy pottery. I'm going to clean you all out. Um, again, the Surat family and Amjad Foundation, we decided to donate some money to just buy the pottery. So I went to the 120 shops, all the workshops, and started buying. I would go buy, 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 buy. I just run out. For six months, I was just buying pottery. And the shops cleaned out. Then I have to go back to London, come back three months later for it to fill up again, and then I clean them up again. <laughs> and, um, and this was a way to help revive them. So if somebody made something of a lower quality and not to their standards, I would say, I'm not buying it. So this gave them an idea to really do their work great. Uh, and, and in a way, we used our understanding of folk art and our understanding of markets to get the people um, to um, basically improve quality not change them, but just improve their quality. So we bought many pieces, and it was all ready to be exported to the US. Easy said and done. Bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> the perils of packing pottery, are you kidding me? So now I've got so much pottery, oh my god. This is the house my dad built in Stalin. Um, every room is filled with 4,000 pottery. Every time I go to the bottom, I have to tiptoe through pottery and I'll break a couple and I have to go back and buy and pack it up. And I said to my um, cousin, I had this young cousin of mine as a painting, and he was kind of my little kind of helper. And I said, okay, now we need a lot of bubble wrap. Okay? I said, bubble wrap? What's that? A bubble wrap, like a plastic with those things. I said, I've heard of it. Are you kidding? Bubble wrap, you don't have it? In the whole Afghanistan, we found probably like just one little roll of bubble wrap to, to pack 4,000 pieces. And I thought, I've done all this, I've done all this, and I'm going to be defeated by a bubble wrap. Are you kidding me? That night, I thought, that's it. What are we going to do? I said, Ali, you're a filmmaker, you're a creative. Think, think, think. I said, there's a lot of construction in Afghanistan. I remember at that time I smoked cigarettes, a bad habit. And I was 
I opened the window finally so my dad could see me. As I opened the window, when I closed it, I almost broke the window. And I thought, wait, it's glass, so fragile, wait. If there's all these windows and glasses there, they must be glass factories. So I thought, I got an idea, let's get a van. We went to all the glass warehouses in Kabul. And I said, okay, folks, I'm here to, can I take all your rubbish, all your packing material? And the guy's like, I'm not going to pay anything. I was like, you know, I will pay you. We filled a van full of glass packing material and just took it to Stalin and started packing the pottery and recycling that. We didn't even have newspapers, so that's the best we could come up with. And we made these iron boxes because it was cheap. We just took these old metals and said, look, let's just take the blacksmith make these iron boxes. And we packed like 100 pieces of it at a time. It's easy said and done, pack something and send it to the US, but this is a war zone. Everything is checked. You know, everything is the customs. And I went to the Afghan customs, and when Afghanistan, anything you export, um, the customs have to give you a kind of clearance. And I went to the custom office, and the custom office is a bit all corrupt. This guy, a big guy sitting down, I was playing with his phone. This is the first time they stopped playing his phone. I said, excuse me, sir, I'm here to send pottery to the United States. He's like, ah, there's pottery? Okay, let me look at our custom codes. We don't have custom code for Afghan pottery. I said, um, Bill, can we do something about it? He said, um, why do you want to send this pottery to America? Well, they have their own pottery. <laughs> I was like, you do, but you know, it's like another idea. I'm trying to explain to this guy. <laughs> and um, we finally got it exported. This was the first time I've been pottery has ever, ever been exported. And they actually made an export number code, which is so proud of that. And I have this little thing in my room. <laughs> and we exported to the US. Um, and it took about three and a half months. And you got to understand, about 30% of it broke. But we were anticipating that. That's where we bought this many pieces. I don't know, most of you know the Santa Fe folk art market. I think this was in the year 2007. Um, it was probably, I think, the third or the fourth annual event. And for those of you who haven't been to this event, you should go. Um, and in 2007, um, we exhibited the pottery um, at this international folk art market. Uh, this is Ireland's whole team. He has this huge gallery. We got everybody involved. We packed. We got this booth and we got everything set up. And we worked very hard. That's Sylvia. That's his son. And they did the work with us. And we had all the thing and ready. And, um, and you got to understand when I was doing the work in Afghanistan and trying to inspire people, I told them, I will introduce this to the world. Those are just words. And I just wanted to cite them up. And one day, Dad took me to the side of his son. You, know, you can't make people promises to the people and not, not deliver. That's false hope. Nothing worse than false hope. So it was so nice that we finally managed to find a way to show this to the world. And Santa Fe Folk Art Market brought 65,000 people sometimes. So there's a lot of people came. And, um, oh my God, I talk so much. Everybody is coming to tell them the story. And, so and, and people were mesmerized by it. Everyone was mesmerized by the story of what we did. Everyone was just flooded the booth. I think by about two days, I lost my voice. Um, and um, it captured the imagination of the people. And you see the kindness. Bridges cultures. Art bridges cultures. You know, in the time of division, how do we connect people? This is one of the ways to do it. And I've done it before, I think. Maybe I'll come up with another way to do it. And of course, this captured the imagination of the media, and um, people started interviewing me, and I didn't do it for any of this. I didn't do it for fame, for this. But it was important for me to show the plight of Afghan people and Afghan pottery to the world. Um, and for some reason, how humble it left us was, um, you know, everybody, you know, CNN did an interview in the world, and everybody started writing about the pottery. And of course, Slowly, Star of Pottery got a bit of um, traction. I mean, and the irony of it all is that when I go to Star of now, I don't think some of the older people have died and some of the young people, they don't have a clue who I am. And I like it that way. It's important for people. It has to be about us, it has to be about them. And it's important this about them. Last time I went to Afghanistan was 2006, and the situation got a bit bad. But in 2015, I got the bravery, I went back to sitting with my dad, silent. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And the, the, the community is functioning. 
There's no sign of war. There's no sign of destruction. And I remember what he said. Oh God has the ability to empower, sustain, and elevate me. That's what it tells us. Thank you very much, David.